Welcome to Season 4 of the Art of Teaching podcast. I'm Matthew Green and I'm so grateful that you joined me today. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you that have subscribed, listened and reviewed the episodes. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Welcome to another episode of the Art of Teaching podcast. It's my great pleasure today to introduce you to Professor Stephen Heppel, who is an English educator specialising in the use of ICT in education. He is Professor at Bournemouth University and also holds a number of other academic positions around the world. He is probably best known for his work Ultralab, where he worked on education projects such as Learning in the New Millennium, Schools Online, Development of Think.com and Talking Heads. Stephen is retained by a number of organisations to help with future policy and education, including the BBC as an associate of KPMG and is retained by the UK government in horizon scanning work to advise of future directions for educational policy. Stephen is also the executive chairman of LP Plus, who are currently developing a Chinese language learning community for 20 million Chinese school students in partnerships with China's Sun New Media Corporation. He's been described by Microsoft as Europe's leading online education expert and also the most influential academic of recent years in the fields of technology and education by the Department for Education in the UK. I hope that you get as much out of this wide ranging discussion as I did. Please enjoy. Stephen Heppel, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me. I really appreciate it. That's a pleasure. Um, um, yeah, I'm a great fan of podcasts anyway. There's nothing like a, a nice gentle conversation to catch people's interest. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. Next. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm incredibly grateful that you would uh, take the time. It's still uh, the, the podcast medium still amazes me that we can have a conversation across the globe and also somebody else on their commute uh, to work in Sydney or wherever they may be listening can can also hear this conversation. So my hope is that there will be a lot of educators around the world that really get something out of our conversation today. Um, uh, quite possibly the most important question, uh, what is your coffee order when I can finally uh, buy your coffee? Well, um, I'm a bit obsessed by coffee. So um, yeah, by, by and large, uh, it's just a strong espresso or short black, I think you have it as, but uh, I really like the beans to be very dark roasted. But yeah. The acidity down a little bit, and um, yeah, I just I'm actually just don't just like coffee, I need coffee. <laughs> is, it, is it the first thing you do in the morning, pretty much? Yeah, well, I live with my granddaughters, um, they're five and, and eight, and the uh, first thing we do in the morning, they come and jump in the bed, and I go off and I make myself the coffee and two hot milks for them, and we sit and have a little sip and contemplate what the day's going to bring, you know. and um, what homework they should have finished and have to rush off and do <laughs> and, sounds, and the way uh, we do and yeah and i have one in front of me i'm right yeah, now too great it sounds like a lovely uh, a lovely way to start the day with your grandkids and, and contemplating what the day uh, has to hold is that something that you have uh, always done or is it more recently because uh, of being uh, confined to your home with this current <laughs> epidemic or no they've heard they, they, they both live with me always so more one of them uh, from birth the other one from she was just um, three years old and she they all came with my daughter as well so we all live in a big old house together fantastic, with, fantastic. Um, with a garden and a uh, slides and it's a very playful space actually <laughs> lovely <laughs> so, lovely that, yeah that's... it is lovely in the end of the years. That sounds great. Um, Stephen, I was just wondering, uh, what's a book uh, that you ha have read either recently or um, or a while ago that has made you stop and reconsider things? Well, that's really, I mean, there's a longer answer to that than there should be really, because you know, when, when um, books started appearing electronically, I, I found that, you know, it's sort of, filling up my phone with, uh, with, with books. And I found that phones, um, phones books tend to be rather like the music on my phone, things that I'm rather fond of from the past. And I like to just dip into and play a little bit, my own, a little bit of Brave New World from Huxley, or a little bit of um, 
whatever, you know, and I, I just kind of read that paragraph or that chapter or that, I don't want to sample them, you know, where, and I tend to do that with music as well, whereas with a book in my hand, you know, yeah. I, I, there's something about the patina of the book and the finding a way for one of my favourites for the two guys who are all or in Australia, it's um, John Bertrand's Born to Win book, you know, which is uh, just a great classic he wrote after on the America's Cup, you know, all those years ago. And um, I, I love, I love the, the whole um, theatre of the book, you know, the way it, the way it starts with catastrophe and then builds, builds yeah. the victory, you know, and you know, I can shut my eyes and put my hands in the fun where the pictures are, you know. So, you know, with physical books, uh, it's the physicality of them I really. I really enjoy a lot, you know. So, but but, but a book that's moved me dramatically, and I find it very hard to pick one because yeah. my life is so full of books. Fantastic. And we have a library in the house. Great. And, um, yeah, that's all yes. Fantastic. And we we will get into obviously uh, your amazing work in education uh, in a moment. But do you uh, do you tend to read um, quite broadly and outside your field of expertise, or do you tend to try and stick um, uh, within that education sphere? That's a good question. I'm, I'm um, uh, aggressively polymathic, actually. And this sort of happened because um, as I went through, you know, um, school, I was, I was pretty good at school, you know, did all that. And uh, I was kind of easily bored. So every sort of every couple of years, I changed track. You know, one minute I was on, you know, engineering and physics, and next minute I was doing metaphysical poetry and you know, sort of leaping around you know to the despair of the teachers and the parents and everybody else and when I, then when I went to university picked uh, and at the university so I'm a great sailor I love sailing is my thing you know. so with the six universities I applied to were the top six in the university sailing league and, you know, I went to university to win the, the university league which we did for two two out of the three years you know but at the end of the first year, I um, they changed the schedule of, of course of, of lectures for the subject I'd chosen. They clashed with the sailing training, so just completely changed degree. You know that. And actually, I found myself in in as an undergraduate sitting in on other people's lectures more than my own. I, I was fascinated by you know oh, that's really interesting. I just go. Sit at the back, typical university, nobody knew who the hell anybody was in it. So I just go and sit there and kind of soak up, uh, you know, whatever it was. And I'm the same now, you know, probably probably reading more quantum computing at this point than anything else. I'm probably wow. more, into, more into that. But at the same time, you know, we're doing all this stuff on um, physical environment, physicality. Yeah. And, you know, so there's a big chunk of cognitive science in all this. And, yeah. And of course, we're doing a lot of work in, in um, sport, elite sport performance. So, you know, I can't help but read what the coaches think they know. They never, they never seem to know that. But, you, know, <laughs> you have to read. It, it sounds incredibly, uh, incredibly varied. Uh, like uh, your uh, your career sounds incredibly varied, just like your reading list. Um, there seems to be a number of uh, really interesting uh, common threads, um, but also it is incredibly uh, broad and wide ranging. And I was just wondering uh, if somebody asks, uh, what do you do? Uh, how do you how do you answer that question? <coughs> Actually, these days I usually um, dodge it and just tell them something. I mean, you know, I figure that covers it. I mean, for example, at the moment we're, we've been asked by a, a very large health trust to work with them on Reducing suicide rates with um, people in um, in uh, you know custodial um, um, mediation, you know, people have been, been locked up for yeah. whatever challenges they they got. You know, their suicide rates are very high, so we're looking really hard at all that. So I'd probably just say that to somebody who may be interested, or I'd pick something else. You know, yeah. we're doing a lot of work on outdoor learning at the moment, so I said yeah. Yeah. If, we, if we were standing up on the beach, I'd say, well, we're doing all this stuff. Yeah. We couldn't begin to say the totality. We'd be still standing there a day later, you know, it would be, be impossible. So I'd, yeah. if you ask the granddaughters is what I do, they'll say, he's a professor. And in their mind, that means I'm slightly mad, you know, I get bent stuff, you know. <laughs> I'm taking on aliens from around the 
around the galaxy because that's what professors do in their television lives. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's really fascinating. Like, I don't think my, my children don't know what I do. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think they particularly mind um, as long as I'm there to, to play with them and read them stories and, and, and uh, help them build their imagination. To be honest, they couldn't care less what I do day to day because uh, as soon as I come home, I'm, I'm dad to them. It's probably the same thing, I think, with your grandkids. Yeah. Yeah, no, they do. That's exactly right. They, and, uh, and I have to tell you, having been a dad before, as a granddad, that the, the granddad role is something to relish and to look forward to. It. So yeah. there's an absolute trip of joy. Yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is a real joy and it moves, uh, moves incredibly fast. Um, um, Stephen, I was just wondering, uh, I'm a, a graduate from the University of Melbourne. Uh, what was your uh, time like at the University of Melbourne? And, and would you mind just maybe unpacking some of the work that you did uh, there? I've, um, that's just a really hard thing. I mean, I've been in so many institutions, you know, I mean, you know, that yeah. the moment I'm based in um, UCJC in Madrid, you know, and of course they're all, they're all spectacularly different because, um, you know, working in Spain, I, you know, the, the insight is interesting, you know, um, Australian universities are very traditional Western in their models and they, you know, they have, you know, sort of regular things that people have to do, like write papers and have citations and, and all that kind of thing, you know, and they have an enormous number of meetings. Uh, you know, I think um, certainly when I was at, when I was at my first the big university, you know, probably spent half my time in meetings. I remember as a, a second university, I was in a meeting and they the, the vice chancellor who thought there were two things meetings, you know, wrote to everybody and said, Can you just, you know, can you just reappraise whether you need to be in the meetings you're in? You know, so I was in this meeting and they said, Well, what the why why do we meet? And nobody could remember, you know. But they said, Well, it's it's quite useful just to see everybody. So we'll carry on doing it, you know. So <laughs> universities are awash with, you know, the bureaucracy of managing everyday life in Spain. It's completely different. Um, I don't think I've ever been to a meeting hardly in Spain. I've had a lot of conversations, but it's, it's called lunchtime. And, um, you know, you have this great swathe of time in the middle of the day for lunch and everybody gets together and they're all, you know, patting each other on the back and, hey, you know, so Matthew, did you get that? Um, did you get that thing ordered? Have you got your questionnaire up and running? Are we all sorted for the global forum? You know, and and all of the meetings all happen over lunch, and then people go back <coughs> to doing useful stuff. So I found in Spain are massively more productive wow. than uh, than I ever was in an English or any other university really yeah, interesting that that's I think that, that's that's fascinating Stephen and there's so much in that in terms of organization organizational design and how we uh, sort of construct these learning environments I mean you've obviously uh, traveled extensively um, around the world and worked at a number of different um, institutions so what are some of the commonalities that you think that you see with great education systems I think um, I don't see many great education systems I see, I do see great education going on, but it's it's very rare, I think, to point to a whole system in a Singapore or something and say, wow, they've really got it right. I mean, they, they've done pretty well. And and I think um I think the ones that that really succeed always are the ones who are um ambitious for the learners and and who, who really understand that. You know, as I, as I understood about halfway through my career, I think that if you um, if you challenge your learners to do something really surprising, mm. they'll astonish you right back at how well they do. And uh, you know, I, I think if I think about the projects, and I've said this often in public, and I think about the projects I've been involved in over. You know, more than 30 years of professor, you know, never, never mind before that. I think the projects that were the most successful were the ones that just frighten the life out of me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and say, Oh, Stephen, you've already done now. You know, you, you just, this is never going to work. You know, you mm. tried to put a computer lab into every superstore in the country, you know, get every child engaged in a project to whatever age they are. 
never going to work, you know. And I'd literally wake up in a cold sweat. Those are the projects that are just ambitious enough to keep up with how good kids can be. And I think, you know, when, when I look back on it and to give it forward, you know, what I see is that the system is never ambitious enough yeah. for how good the kids might be. I think mean, parents will always tell you how good their kids can be and have been in the system yeah. usually. So we've seen a lovely example of that over here with, with um, the COVID. And um, we we had politicians, as you did, as everybody did, really, panicking about children not being learned. Oh, my goodness. They're going to be the catch-up generation. They're going, to, <clears throat> they're going to be falling behind, you know. And yet, if I, if I look back at the... Say Second World War, you know, the, the, which I mean, I've before my time, just that cloud. But, but, uh, but um, you know, I had PhD students who were alive in, in that period. I understand. I know it's the one, you know, was a chief engineer at Ford's who was doing a PhD with me. His childhood during the war was terrifying. I mean, he was literally went to school every day with a bag packed and a label on his jacket. <clears throat> With his name on because he was going to be evacuated. He didn't know when. So for a week, he'd turn up at school every day with his sister, hand in hand, his little baby sister, label on his jacket saying, Stan, I was a bag that you will have one toy, you know, and a couple of other things. Sure enough, on the Friday that week, um, the bus to take him home took him to Wales, you know, the other side of he lived in East London. He was in Wales for, I mean, over a year, you know, a huge amount of time. Never saw his parents, um, no telephone communication. He was suddenly went from being the little boy to being the big boy because his baby sister was, you know, he was kind of responsible for, you know, and then back he came and there were other kids who'd been, you know, hiding in the London underground as the bombs dropped and disappearing down air raid shelters. They had had the most chaotic education program and yet, you know, if you look back on the, um, the post-war period, you know, the, the the people who were the heroes of the post-war period, you know, artistically or in engineering terms, Clive Sinclair just died a couple of weeks ago, you know, pretty much invented single-handed the home computer with his, you know, amazing little Z80 processor-powered spectrums and millions of people learned to program on the things, you know. He was a kid during that era, John Lennon was a kid, during that era, Vivian Westbrook was a kid during that era. You know, they, they, you know, the big bright names of those post war years had the most chaotic um, education childhoods and the resilience they developed as a result was spectacular. So when we started surveying that, we created um, a certificate. It's at, um, yeah, I've just typed it in the chat window for you, but it's it's at um, pebble.net slash golden. And we, we invited kids to say, tell us what you've been doing during lockdown. You know, but the government thinks you've been falling off the education train, but what have you actually been doing? You know, and, and what we got back was spectacularly reaffirming. I mean, uh, and a lot of those kids, you know, went on to, to frame their certificates to be generated for them. Um, you know, saying you are the golden generation. But there are three things that characterize what they were doing. With number one, it was depth, not breadth. You know, they decided they wanted to really get into something. Boy, did they get into it. Whether that was, you know, plumbing or sailing or astrophysics or whatever. They just got into it just playing with amazing depth. And, um, and there was no... So, you know, we're, we're right away there on the stage, not age well. You don't have to wait till you're 13 before you learn the next move in chess. You know, you can do it, you can do it now. Secondly, they did it with others, and the others were very rarely just their age. You know, they did it with siblings, they did it with grandparents, they did it with people on lines of mixed age, stage not age. And, and lastly, of course, they did it connected with others who weren't there. You know, they mm. did it with on the same line of long, longitude, on the same line of latitude. You know, they were global learners. And I think kids, when we took the education system away to kids, from kids, they fell to 
what education looks like in the future. They just fell there because you know, learning had escaped the boxes we put it in. Yeah. And it was really interesting to see where it had gone. And well, it's pretty exciting. Wow, well, that I mean that's that, that's fascinating because if you read um any of the news reports, not necessarily the academic journals, but the news reports about the impact of COVID and and uh, all of the the psychological damage that it's done to learning, it's it seems like you are a lot more optimistic than most. Um, would that be fair? Yeah, it would. But I but it's um, I think there's rich irony in the fact that people who spend all day every day telling children that they're going to be a lost generation, that they're going to be the catch up generation. Yeah. BBC did a feature program showing how many tens of thousands of pounds worse off the kids are going to be. If your message to kids every day is that, of course they're going to have LinkedIn um, depression and, and all sorts of mental health wobbles. Absolutely. But if you say to them, you will be the next golden generation, I don't mean that artificially, they will be. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, the, they're the ones, you know, they're the ones who are resilient enough to be able to cope. I mean, look at the unexpected things. That we've had in the last couple of years, you know, COVID, Trump, um, climate disasters, Brexit. Um, Sorry to bring that up, but Bre well, yeah, Brexit. I mean, there's, every time you open a newspaper, there's another surprise. You know, it's um, like in Melbourne, even the footy team finally winning. I mean, <laughs> it's a constant surprise, you know. Um, and I think, you know, we want kids who are, wow, well, what, what, what are we going to do now? We want mm. kids who say that. Whereas we, and, and I mean, one of the reasons I think, not to be harsh on politicians, they all, you know, I'm sure their mums all love them and they all, they all <laughs> um, try to do their best, but most of them came through an education system where, you know, they did a big test and that kind or whatever. And the teachers were saying, and well, I hope there's no surprises on the exam paper. And they were turning the paper over saying, I hope I'm prepared for everything. And then we send them out into a world which is full of surprises and where they're prepared for nothing. And then of course our politicians have struggled to cope with mm. the challenge of COVID. You know, they they say, quick, let's get back to normal. Let's get the kids back. Let's let's get kids catch up tutorials, you know. Yeah. Of course they've failed to appreciate the importance of resilience yeah. and ingenuity because they haven't got it themselves. And that's not their fault. And do you think, um, uh, Stephen, so do you think that we are doing an, an adequate job of preparing young people for the future? And also my follow-up question is, um, why is it so hard to change? I know we're talking in general terms here, but why is change so difficult when it comes to education systems? Um, because my argument would be if we know where we're going and it's not the right destination, why don't we do something about it? But is that easier said than done? Well, it's really hard, isn't it? And people, <clears throat> you know, people can have a sort of duality in their heads, you know. That, I mean, many people knew that smoking killed, but they carried on smoking, you know. So mm. when plenty of people, you know, when we brought out seatbelts, there were people running around saying, oh, I'm never going to wear a seatbelt. I won't be able to get out of my car if it catches fire. I mean, all sorts of, of reasons why people ignored the science, you know. Um, but eventually we get that. I mean, you look at health, they used to bleed people for health. They would you know, cut you and bleed you to let out the bad humours you know, that were um, supposedly making you ill. If you look at a barber and a barber's shop, you know, a hairdresser, there's a red and white striped pole outside that represents the blood and the bandages because the barbers did the bleeding because they had the sharp knives, you know. But even after we realised that hygiene was pretty important, and bleeding wasn't really very helpful. Mm. You know, they kept on bleeding people for 50 or 60 years. Um, you know, so it's quite hard for people to let go of what they think. They know this is the right way to do it. Mm. And you see this with the gap between parents and schools, you know, parents saying, but, we, but we've always taught multiplication tables. You know, I don't care about your, your understanding. You just need to know that eight eights are 64. And you'll be you'll be in clover, you know. And the schools are saying, no, no, they, they really need to understand their kind of the, the, the bases and their base tens and so on. Otherwise, they're never going to go on. You know? So there's always been, you know, a tension between what we thought we knew and what we now knew. Mm. And I don't think that's any different now. I think what we've got, 
are three groups of schools or educational institutions, but certainly county universities. You've got the group who are the kind of barbers, really, the, the bleeders, you know, who are saying, well, let's just get back to normal, you know. That's, uh, and actually, when COVID came along, you know, with the rise of well, the first thing they did was put all the desks back in rows. And they said, oh, this is very important because, yeah, you know, it's a complete and utter tosh. You know, there was nothing that suggests, you know, we, we run the seminars here on on the, you know, the physics of the uh, of aerosol contamination. And I'll tell you for nothing, if kids are all sitting in those facing the same way and the ones at the back are speaking up, you know, there's a draft, there's a current running through the room. It's far more dangerous than if they're sitting in, Little groups and clusters. So they kind of the, those those schools will, will grab anything to get back to what they think is safe. And they're not malicious; they're just wrong. Um, then there's a group who I think are saying, and, and probably Australia has more of these schools than many countries. Very lucky, I think. They're saying, okay, well, this is what we're doing. How can we do it better? You know, how can we improve the furniture? The physical environment, the pedagogy, the, the, you know, but they haven't kind of gone beyond that. They've, they've said, you know, how could we finesse the school we've already got and, and, you know, and do a really good job. And that's a really important group of people. But then there's another lock over here, which is actually what might it look like? Yeah. And if you think about, um, you know, the, the um, smartphone was invented in well, some debate in the literature that 1995 would be the first time I had my hand on what I'd call a smartphone, you know. And it wasn't until I know, 2009, was it? I don't know, when Steve Jobs leaps up on the stage and, and memorably says, I've got three things to announce. I've been an inventor. You know, we finally got an iPod with a full screen, you know, very human tune. And then he says, and we're going to use that pocket small screen um, to produce something which allows you to surf the internet properly. No more WAP, you know, and all those other nonsensical attempts to put the World Wide Web in your phone, you know. It's going to be a proper browser. And we're going to build a better phone. And by the way, it's all the same device, you know. Mm. And um, But immediately, you know, Steve Ballmer, I remember from Microsoft, said that, You'll be lucky to get 1% of the market for that. You know, it's complete nonsense. Yeah. And there were people walking around for 10 years with Blackberry saying, it's really important to have a full keyboard. You know, you can't do this without a proper keyboard. You know, it was like, it was obvious that they were wrong. You know, they're thinking about keyboard, little tiny window. The thing was almost impossible to use. And, yeah. you know, the IT department in their company said, you must have this because it's, you know, and so they, they kind of say, but in the schools, where's the iPhone? If you sort of mean, where's somebody coming along and saying, never mind what you've been doing, this is what it might look like. Yeah. And I think we're really short of those blue sky yeah. instances. And the nearest thing you've got in um, New South Wales will be Lin Linfield Learning Village, which I had a pleasure to be part of. You know, yeah. it's kind of mixed age, stage to age, based, you know. I have been there a number of, uh, not a number of times, I've been there a few times and it, it's incredibly inspiring because it, it shows that, that the possibility and I think one of the things that, that seems particularly challenging uh, about change is the messiness and I know that as uh, educators we, um, sorry, as educators it's easy to regulate and to standardise because it's easier to control. Um, uh, but did you, uh, so would you mind talking a little bit about how do we as educators, uh, educators embrace that messiness and how do we make sure that we are creating learning environments that um, not only can the students ask questions, but also we can put our hands up as teachers and say, hey, let's try this. How do we, how do we innovate? Sorry, that's a very broad question. Well, teachers are really good at that. And, and, and um, you know, I think every teacher will tell you, I mean, here it's a really windy day. Today and the school is a different place when it's windy. Absolutely. When it's calm, you know, just huge difference. And unless you talk, you really don't appreciate that, you know. Or if a uh, you know, kid falls off a, a motorbike and has a, you know, a, a, a horrendous accident, you know, the whole school is a different place for a, you know, a week, a month, a term if they die. You know. and, and, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, kids have different experiences. You're sitting there writing on your whiteboard and, and um, 
you know, Joanne comes in a bit late and she's never late, you know. And you just say, Joanne, you're a bit late. Just get yourself sat down. This stuff over here is going to be important. And you put a little star and a J on the board for her, you know. You know, I mean, we, we, we personalize all the time mm. what we're doing. And yet, as we move up the system, um, you know, that, that personalization seems to disappear. And, yeah. you know, we end up with a model of a, you know, of a, a national curriculum that's incredibly boxed in, incredibly constrained. Mm. I mean, you used to have this wonderful, this, because the states all competed a little with each other. I remember when the multimedia came along in the end of the 80s, you know, kind of Western Australia with UWA and Curtin and Edith Coward, who really caught cool stuff in multimedia. And, um, you know, CD ROMs coming out, there it is, you know. And then they sort of passed the bat and they were poor, so enough change, you know. And, uh, you know, somebody else, maybe Victoria, picked up the baton, you know, and then, um, you know, and then, wow, look at the Lutherans up in Queensland, you know. And so, you know, they had, you had that sort of ability to, whew, to take a little rest. I was uh, very much like a peloton in a cycle race, you know. Yeah. So there's a minute you go to a national model with a national curriculum, you know, what you said to everyone in the peloton is, well, you just, you just got to keep your order, just you can't take it in turns, you know, yeah. to lead. The whole peloton slows down, you know, so, yeah. you know, but, but, but what, what the bottom end of that granularity is, of course, children. Yeah. And, you know, with, I think without exception in, in my career, you know, that, that, sense of learner led being the most rapid speed to get to where you want to go. Yes. Not not coconut instruction, properly learner led, properly saying to the kids, I don't care what your opinion is. I don't want to know that. I want to know what your research is. You know, you find out what other schools are doing, come back and talk to me about it. Let's see what might work here. You know, we're a unique community, we're unique kids. You're actually unique year last year, lot of right old bunch, you know. I mean, what's going to work for you? Yeah. Uh, is a really interesting way to move forward. And, and we just don't do that enough. Yeah. But you know the impact of technology is we will. Yeah. You know, technology gives us personalization. Look at what he's doing to health. Yeah. You know, there was a time in health I'd turn up to the doctor and he sort of tested blood pressure or whatever. I've got COVID in the moment, so I'm a bit croaky. I really am not at all well at this point. So sorry for that. Your voice, but you know, I turn up the doc and he told me what was wrong with me. I didn't need to talk anymore. You know, I can, I've got data, I've got internet of things, devices, I've got Google, I've got academic papers. You know, I am my own diagnosis, and I go to the, the doc beyond that for remediation. You know, what okay, I know what's wrong, how are you going to fix it? You know, that's you know, and suddenly an apple is saying, Yeah, we're actually a health company, we're going to be. With our, with our watches, we're going to be um, selling healthy living to people mm. beyond everything else we do. You know? So, same is true of education. You know? But you know, again, let me give you an example of that. Um, we've been measuring the physical environment in all the spaces. Um, we're interested in the CO2, the TVOCs, those volatile organic compounds, the PM 2.5, the sooty material. That comes to the door from the diesel cars. We're interested in humidity and temperature and sound, and particularly perhaps light levels. And when we go into an exam room, we find incredible levels of, of unfairness. You know, the kids in the dark, hot, gloomy corner are going to do 5% worse than the kids in the light, airy, cool corner. So we have this myth of a level playing field with exams. But the minute you dish out a seating plan, some of the kids are being treated unfairly. Well, at the moment, kids are tolerating that. But the minute their watch or their phone says to them, hang on a minute, you know, you go home to your dad. And he says, oh, that was the exam. And he'll say, well, I, did, you know, I could barely stay awake, dad. Look at the ceiling, two levels of my, my side of the room, you know. Oh, my Lord, three and a half thousand parts per million, you know. And the dad's on the phone to the school and the exam board saying, I demand a you know, restitution of my son's performance because he was gassed by his own emissions in the corner and other kids weren't, you know. But the minute the kids have got the data, you can't pretend anymore. But the ubiquitous 
uniformity is other than unfair. Yeah. And everything changes at that point. So I'm really optimistic. Great. Yeah. It um I, I mean I, I it's really inspiring to hear um uh, to hear you talk with such optimism. It's really wonderful because um it, it's obviously really very important conversations to be having and, and what a hopefully what a what a turning point we have in education at the moment with with this ongoing global pandemic it, it's a really it's a really fascinating time i mean uh, your body of work uh, as stephen is just um extraordinary and there's so much uh, we could talk for hours about the work that you're doing um but i also want to be respectful of your time i mean you've, you've been uh, described by uh, microsoft as europe's leading online education expert and also one of the most influential academics of recent years in the field of technology and education which is it's not bad for a bio. I think that, that's that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> no, they're but, nice. They're nice things, and they're yeah. And people are very generous with their with their warm words, and I, and um, you know, I don't, I don't think I've ever done a project on my own though. So all the projects yeah. always been with kids and teachers and parents. And, I'm just uh, really curious. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry to cut you off. There is a little bit of a delay, so my apologies if I cut you off. I'm just curious. Um, Stephen, how do you uh, define the term technology? Um, and um, what are some of the uh, the trends that you see at the moment, especially coming back to a conversation about what's happening globally with COVID? So in it, it, simplest form, what is technology and why has it uh, why is it so important? Well, it's, I mean, it's a better way. That's a, it's a profound question. We could do a PhD on that, but the, you know, it, obviously it's the, um, devices and tools, particularly tools that we use to, to allow us to do things we couldn't previously do. And that's everything from electricity and the fountain pen through to um, uh, you know, nano, <laughs> yeah. nano robots scampering around our bloodstream, you know, it's all. Um, but I think if we look at the general picture of it, there's a very clear um, narrative. When we first get technologies, of whatever sort, what we try and do is to finesse what we were already doing. So I remember when we first look up on here, when we first brought out the CD ROM, you know, <laughs> this was, I don't know what date, well, what the hell was this? 1989, this is a set of CD ROM tools for multimedia. <laughs> um, and we produced these things with a huge amount of stuff. And I remember having um, phone, I had a phone call from the Encyclopedia Britannica, who I'm sure are lovely people, but they, they phoned up and shouted down the phone. I don't like people shouting. They shouted because we were selling these CDs for, you know, five pound a time. And they'd said, you know, we've calculated the amount of content on a CD box. And if you sell it for anything less than about 750 pounds, you're destroying the market for content. You know? And I was trying to say to them, they're going to give these away in magazines soon. They came to be free, you know. They would they could be in cross with me because I'm selling them for five quid. You know, it's, it's happened. Move on, you know. And they, they really didn't didn't get it because what they thought was, we'll take our encyclopedia and put it on a CD roll. And that's the end of that. Um, what then happens is the technology gets better. And we say to ourselves, well, um, never mind what can we do that we couldn't do very well before. The question now is what would we like to do? And that's a very different question. Yeah. So a lot of technology and education has been about, well, how can we, you know, they can do creative writing better, or how can we, how can we approach our understanding of geometric and arithmetic progression in a spreadsheet because I mm. the numbers and what you can do. And what we learned, I think, from the early days onwards was that once you say, well, what would I like to do? That's the point when people take risks with their level. Yeah. Yeah. So we go from a model of finessing to a model of taking risks with their learning. And when I used to run Ultra Lab, it was a wonderful lab. I, mean, I, don't know how we got, I don't know how we got away with running it for 21 years, but <laughs> blue sky. Massive of funding, you know, just the time of our lives, really. We had a thing called Ultra Labs Law, which was an internal law to ourselves or by other people quoting that, which 
which is basically that in the space between denial and legislation is the space for subversion really for opportunity for change yeah. so along comes a technology TikTok, you know and people say TikTok will never have anything to do with education it's not you know it's this is you know TikTok is full of um you know divorced um mid, mid career women you know trying to seduce partners or whatever I don't know. but then you realize that actually TikTok's got quite a lot of um quite interesting stuff you know some of the best physics teaching in your life is going on in there looking at somebody doing a well-being thing for students she's got 23 million followers you know so sooner or later you know somebody will come along and say right TikTok is an important part of the Australian curriculum. We'll have a TikTok module, you know, and, the, and then it's over. You know, <laughs> first of all, they say it's never going to happen, and eventually they kind of legislate it's going to happen in this way. And in that space, that's our space for changing opportunity. And the trick with all this is to keep moving. Don't don't kind of nail your colours to the CD-ROM. <laughs> just you know, nail your colours to the learners. And yeah. just keep it, and that's a very big space. It takes a long time for people to stop denying that there will never be a place for the calculator in the classroom. Oh, well, now there is, but you have to have the Casio FX one two three four, and no other calculator will do. You can't have reverse Polish logic calculators because they give you the right answer but in the wrong way. You know, there's a there's a space between that that denial. Yeah. And that legislation, and there's a sweet spot for change. Yeah, it's really uh, interesting, Stephen. Uh, your uh, uh, description of um, Encyclopedia Britannica has got me thinking. Uh, many years ago, I was uh, working in a school, and we were having this big um, conversation and this big moral dilemma of if we should throw out the entire collection of Encyclopedia Britannicas that we had uh, because it was taking up space. And uh, my argument, which wasn't particularly popular, uh, was that um, the um, the information was already out of date. And so what's the point? And you can get everything this on uh, on uh, on the Internet. So it's really interesting, isn't it? I think quite often we hold on to things for um, a sentimental value when we should really let it go. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I have to declare myself to be a bit of a softy in that respect. I mean, I, the boat I sailed was built in 1907, and they hadn't even invented the motor car here. So people were going around the town on, on horseback. You know, we still sail it in a very traditional way. We don't have winches or, you know, computers on board or anything. And, you know, I like that a lot, and it's a lot of fun. You know, but at the same time, I'm not riding around the village on a horse. You know, it's a... You know, it's a, it's a nice artifact to have. Uh, you know, it's nice to have a silver teaspoon that's, you know, Georgian or whatever, you know. It's, um, but, we, but we shouldn't lock our lives into that moment yeah. and not move forward. That's the key thing, really. And, and of course, the, the trouble was, those encyclopedias, they weren't just valuable. They signified something. You know, if you went to visit a friend and they had a row of encyclopedias in their front room, this was a pretty classy family. You know, somebody had spent hundreds of dollars on, you know, equipping the house with knowledge. And, um, you know, if you threw them away and just put in paperbacks of Fifty Shades or whatever, you know, that sort of that, you know, that semiotics of that family were, were broken. You know, so books, as I was saying earlier, you know, books do more than just contain what's in them. You know, there, there's more to them than that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting, uh, Stephen, and, and there is uh, there is so much of your work uh, that I would love to cover, um, but I and maybe we'll have to organise a uh, a round two because I, I wanted to obviously talk about some of your incredible work uh, with the LP Plus, uh, your role as chairman uh, in terms of um, uh, Chinese language learning, and your work obviously with the Inclusion Trust. So there's so much uh, for us to discover, but uh, to talk about, but I, I'm just incredibly grateful, uh, Stephen, that you would take the time and talk to me today. Um, it's really wonderful to um, to see someone who is a 
an agent for change and also incredibly optimistic about the direction and think in, in which things are, are headed. So uh, thank you for, um, for, like I said, for taking the time uh, to talk with me today. Um, and, and just um, as we uh, wrap up, where can people find out more about you? And uh, where can people stay in touch with your amazing work? Because it is, it is immense. Yeah, I mean, I have the world's most chaotic website because I tend to post things as we're doing them. I, I, somebody told me the other day that the list of current projects is about seven years out of date, so I didn't need to update that a bit. But um, heppel.net, H E W P E W L, heppel.net is a website. 25 million people on that server last year. So a huge, huge number of people go there. And it's not the world's best indexing, but there is a search thing on the front, you know, so if you wanted to type in you know, exclusion or shoeless learning or you know, we do a we're doing a lot of stuff on on brain food, you know, what should you eat? What should you eat to get your brain as good as it can be, you know? And if you want to look at any of those things, just just use the search engine to find your way around. And we probably should do another session if, if people are interested in this one. Let's absolutely maybe come back and let's let's pick, you know, my five favorite projects or something will say a little about what we learned from absolutely from those i enjoy that a lot definitely <laughs> and, and Stephen, your your work like i said is is so immense and um, it would be a huge privilege to get to chat to another point and and um hear some of your and really do a bit of a deep dive into some of the things that you're working on but um uh, i can't thank you enough for taking the time i hope that you uh, start to feel better soon um, and my, my, my thoughts are with you. So thank you for uh, talking to me, even though you're a bit croaky. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Art of Teaching podcast today. I hope that you, like me, got some valuable insights out of our discussion. For show notes, please visit theartofteachingpodcast.com. I've one favour to ask. If you could please head to the iTunes page of the podcast and rate and review the episode. This would really help to get the interviews and resources to as many people as possible. Also, I've created a private Facebook group so that we can continue the discussion after each episode. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and until next time.